appreciate the invitation to come and visit with you. Uh, I was talking to a few of you as you came in or as the other class was leaving, and I've gotten to see your faces on Facebook and heard your illness stories <laughs> <laughs> and your happy stories at the ashram. And, um, I really have, uh, even though I haven't met you personally, I feel like I know a little bit about you and the dedication you have to the honors program. So we're going to talk about undergraduate research, and as we talk about it, I want you to realize that all of you sitting here um, can send something and prepare something for the WT Student Research Conference that's going to happen on April 16th. And I brought some information about that. It's a Thursday. And there are different ways of presenting your work that we'll get into. But when you say undergraduate research, what comes to mind? Um, research papers. papers. Okay, Long research papers, papers. right. Long <laughs> research papers. <laughs> okay, well, it's, it's more than long research papers. Um, and in fact, the WT conference stipulates that your paper can be no longer than 12 pages. Oh, yay. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and, and that has to do with the judging of the papers in a timely manner. Um, so, I, I want us to, to look at research with a, sort of a, a bigger scope. I brought some sample research posters and I have some student work to show you as well. So, um, as we look at the whole idea of research, um, I want you to think of, so where do I begin? The two students that you see there were graduates in, of our communication program last May, and they're shown at the Southern States Communication Association Conference. Their papers that they wrote in the capstone class in communication were accepted for presentation at the undergraduate research conference. And um, both of them are rhetorical essays, which is a, a really um, interesting field for me because that's one of the classes I teach. But you always need to begin with a topic that interests you. Now, when you're in a class and the paper is required, sometimes you don't have a lot of choice. But in this particular case, if you're doing something independently or doing something with the honors program, you have choice. So choose something that you like. Choose something that you're interested in. If you like pop culture, and I'm going to show you an example of that, choose that. Um, Sally, um, the blonde in the picture, really liked Freedom Writer's Diary. She liked the movie, she liked the book. And so for her capstone project, that is what she analyzed uh, using a rhetorical method um, that I'm going to show you in, in a little bit. Um, <clears throat> when you write, um, you need to find a mentor next. Now, of course, you've got three mentors in this room that can help you along the way. And all three of them have a master's degree from WT. So we have certified them to be good researchers. <laughs> so, okay, you've already got a mentor, even though your field might be in the sciences, they can still give you the shape of how a research proposal should go together. And if they can't, then they'll find another faculty mentor for you. But finding a mentor is extremely important, especially if you're new to this, because research is more than those bibliography papers that you wrote in your English classes. It goes beyond that. So when you write a research proposal, and this is getting ready to do the research, this is just saying, hey, this is what I want to study. You have to start with a rationale. Now, so what is a rationale? Why are you doing it? What you doing? Exactly. You have to indicate why this is important to study and why <coughs> the way you are approaching it is new and different from what everyone else has already done. Uh, it doesn't have to be lengthy, but you're always going to have a rationale. And then you have a theoretical lens. What do you think that means? Like how you're you? looking at what you're researching? How you're looking at it? what the research could be? Well, <laughs> perhaps that, that's going to probably come down a little bit in the, um, the literature section. But the theoretical lens in uh, communication, for example, because of course that's my field, students can choose a variety of communication theories. And those of you who've taken the basic speech class and then the interpersonal class have run across some of those. So for example, there's a theory that you probably learned about that ca is called uncertainty reduction. And that theory in communication simply means that people seek information when they're unsure about something. And it leads to either uh, them understanding the, the concept a little bit better or pulling away from it. And so if I was using that as my lens, you know, these imaginary glasses I'm putting on, I would see whatever topic that I was studying through that lens. And if you are in the sciences, again, you are going to use a theoretical approach that has already been found in the literature, something that helps you analyze whatever your research question is. So you need to have a brief literature section, 
And that is what you're used to doing in most of your English classes. That's essentially what you're doing when you uh, write a research paper, unless it's a literary analysis. And um, in that, what you do, if you are like my student that I'm going to show you in a few minutes, she wanted to um, analyze Big Bang Theory. How many of you watch Big Bang Theory? <laughs> okay. Well, even if you haven't watched it, you've probably heard it or you've seen the, the commercials for it. And what interested her about Big Bang Theory was how women were portrayed. And so she used a feminist lens to look at the portrayal of women, particularly in the fourth season. She just limited her um, research paper to the, or her rhetorical analysis to that um, <coughs> season. And after you have put all together what other people have said, and what they have found, you'll find conflicting things. You'll find some people that are supporting maybe an idea that you like, and you'll find some people that are not supporting, that are exactly opposed. But that's what you do at a lit review. You show uh, what has already been done. And then you come up with a research question, and after you pose that, you come up with a method. And we're used to the scientific method in your lab classes that you've had for your lab sciences, right? When you have a lab session, what is the real purpose of the uh, activity that you have? To prove or disprove your hypothesis. Right. You have a hypothesis, right. <coughs> now, in social science research, communication falls in that area. We sometimes have hypotheses, especially if you are uh, using statistical tests that lend themselves to that. Uh, but you can also approach it from another direction, uh, rhetorically. You're not asking if something is proved or not. In fact, you don't even use that word. Uh, but you ask about how images, how words are being used, and that becomes your research question. So when you're writing your proposal, you're going to have these things in it. And again, uh, a sample research proposal is not going to be very long. Um, the brief literature review will be expanded as you get into um, the research itself. So um, this is the example that I wanted to show you that um, my student Chandice Milner completed. Her paper has been accepted for the undergraduate conference this year that will be in Tampa, Florida. And so you can see from the title um, that she certainly decided her focus, her lens, was going to be a feminist criticism. And she took a look at the Big Bang Theory. So let me take you through her presentation so you can get an idea of how she approached it. Now, if she were here, she would, uh, let's see, she would do a better job of You can press escape on the keyboard. Well, last I was just trying to do that. Okay, here we go. Thank you. <laughs> right, we're going to talk about just some of the nuts and bolts. But when you have an oral presentation at WT, you also have the option of doing an oral presentation without submitting a complete paper. You can have your research, but you would just do the oral presentation. And if you choose to do that, you should plan to have a PowerPoint. You should plan to have some visual support for what you're talking about. And it also helps organize your presentation. But so on you guys have to write a paper. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're opening, and if you, if you write a paper, you actually become eligible for the cash prizes. So I, I usually have my students, uh, well, I, I really strongly encourage them to go ahead and submit their papers. They've been written, they might as well submit them. So you come up with uh, your opening slide that indicates your affiliation and your na name. And then, of course, the title um, that you're using. You, s you start with your research question. So in her, qu in her case, uh, and it's a good idea, especially in um, rhetorical analysis like this, you don't ask a yes or no question. You ask a question that's going to let you explore whatever the artifact is. So, how is gender constructed in the fourth season of the Big Bang Theory? She has limited um, her study to one season because that was when you had the addition of what characters? You guys remember? Was it the mm -hmm. girlfriend of Sheldon's? Uh huh. It was. And she was introduced. Miss Blossom. Yeah, and she was introduced, right? Until that time, who was the only female? And Penny. Penny. Right. And what do we know about Penny? She's, She's the typical like, girly girl. She's yeah, I mean, the stereotype that we have, <laughs> Penny usually uh, falls into that. But in the fourth season, we had these other two um, characters introduced. Oh. So, <laughs> nice. 
Um, when you are doing this type of analysis, you provide the audience, again, the judges that are looking at this, you've already written the paper, so you're taking things from the paper, but you tell them about the artifact. In this case, uh, what Chandis did, she talked about um, the awards that had happened. She um, also explained who uh, it appeals to, and you can see who it's popular among. Then, the next thing you do is um, explain your methodology. And in her case, she used FOSS, which is um, the textbook we use in the capstone course. And she explained the two processes that you go through. You take the artifact, which in this case is the fourth season, and you first analyze how gender is constructed, how it's put together, how men and women are being portrayed. And then you look at the implications. So uh, what does it mean that Penny is portrayed in the way she is? In this case, in her analysis and in um, the papers that students write for me, the analysis section is always going to be the longest because that's when you take whatever the artifact is. And we use the term artifact. I know that sounds like it's from a museum, but it's the term that's used for whatever text you're studying, whether it's a film, television, a series. It could even be an ad campaign with images. <coughs> um, but you look at the artifact and then you um, apply whatever lens. In this case, it was from this criticism. So she talks about um, how Penny is presented. She talks about the positioning of the audience um, to believe that men are naturals at being intelligent and occupationally successful. Because Penny's occupation is what? A bartender. She's a bartender. And what is Sheldon's? He's a physicist. He's a genius. He's a nerd. Right? Yeah. Does he make more money than Penny? Yeah. Right. And so when, when she was analyzing that, you know, she pointed, pointed that out. Now, um, another thing that you can do, and, and what Chandis did in her own presentation, is she explained her analysis using feminist criticism. She pulled together some images from the series and talked about how the women were presented, uh, and again, sometimes how they were sexualized, and how sometimes they were stereotyped. Um, in this particular method, you also look at the concept of hegemony, and that happens when one view is presented as dominant over others. And uh, she goes on and explains how that happens in the case of Sheldon. And um, Amy, if any of you remember, have seen a replay of that. Uh, Sheldon unfriended Amy simply because she attempted to prove him wrong. Mm -hmm. You don't ever prove Sheldon wrong, right? <laughs> okay. Well. Uh, what Chandis did from her lit review, she had learned that women hold only 25% of STEM jobs. And of course, the show reflects that, doesn't it? Because mm -hmm. all the scientists that we meet with Sheldon are men. Right. Mm -hmm. Except with the addition of one character that was uh, added to the fourth season. <clears throat> so she goes on to explain uh, in her conclusion, you always have a conclusion, this is a little lengthy for PowerPoint. Um, and so one of the critiques that we talked about in changing this was that we probably would use a more bulleted approach. But um, she went ahead and, and gave um, sort of an extended conclusion. Now one thing that's different, and this will probably go against what Professor Gibson and Professor Ingham have told you about PowerPoint. You always should use 28 point or font. Um, when you're presenting at a research conference, you have to show that you have a bibliography. And so you still go ahead and list your sources. Um, depending, again, on the, the PowerPoint presentation you use, sometimes it lets you in, use APA style. This one is written that way. But what uh, Chandis will do when she presents this, she will, of course, not linger on those. But should someone in the audience, because there's always questions and answers, if someone in the audience wants to uh, question her or find out a source that she used, she just has to go directly to her reference list, pull it up, especially if there's hyperlink. And um, so she's ready to answer any questions that might arise about that. OK, so does that look like a study that you could do? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so, too. Did she conduct any original research? Well, in rhetorical research, what you do is study the text. Okay. And so she could have added a qualitative part to it. And a qualitative part would have been surveying a class like you. Now, if you do that, you have to get IRB approval. So let's get to talking about IRB. Who knows what that means? No. Mm -hmm. OK. Well, then this will be the trivia thing that you can, um, can tell people after you have heard this. 
we will get to the IRB in just a minute, but when we talk about types of research, um, these are some general categories. The one that I've just shown you is rhetorical criticism. And that doesn't require permission from an institutional review of human subjects because you are just analyzing a text. But if I added another piece to that, then I probably would have to do um, and get approval from my university to conduct a survey and then uh, give it to students, whether it's in online format or um, just in print. But rhetorical criticism and literary criticism generally do not require that unless you add that as part of your methodology. You can. Literary criticism differs from rhetorical criticism in that in, instead of using theories of communication, uh, you look at literary theorists. You might look at it from a narrative lens and you would probably look at character development or you might look and compare um, an author's first works with his late works or her late works to see what changes have happened. But when you get into um, these next two, qualitative and quantitative studies, almost always you're going to have to have IRB approval, Institutional Review Board, even for presenting at WT. If you're going to conduct original research with human subjects, you would have to have approval um, by whatever uh, organization that you have at AC that does that. Qualitative includes um, doing ethnographic research, and ethnographic research means observing. Um, you are the observer, and so you kind of um, have to guard against observer bias. But for example, um, one of Professor Ingham's good friends, uh, Professor Baum at our um, at WT is an instructor for us, and for one of her research studies, she went out to the Big Texan and observed people, and especially those that were trying to eat that <laughs> huge <laughs> steak. Um, so she spent, and I think that she was required to do 15 hours of observation. Mm -hmm. She collected all of that and then made observations about how people reacted to it and described the people who entered into the contest. So if you've been there before, these poor people are put on a platform, <laughs> on a table, and there's a clock ticking. Um, and of course you're watching them eat. Um, <laughs> that probably says more about the people watching than the person eating, but anyway. Uh, when Carolyn conducted that, she was doing ethnographic study. But you could also do a focus group. And focus groups also require IRB approval, although it usually has exempt status. Meaning that, let's say we got a focus group together. You are a little bit too large for a focus group, but if I had probably six or eight of you, um, and let's say I wanted to conduct some research about your travel to India and Nepal, I could conduct a focus group. I could find out uh, cultural things that you um, learn from the experience. We could talk about positive experiences, negative experiences, and then I would code the transcript because I would have to type up the transcript that I had recorded and then look at common things that you know occurred and occurred again. Now quantitative studies, um, they're found in both social science and hard sciences. So we were talking about hypotheses. Uh, quantitative studies usually are going to be um, the kind of things when we are trying to either support are not support. And those of you who've heard about the null hypothesis know that we really don't ever prove anything. We just support or we say that we have no support for. Um, researchers are very, very careful to use the word prove. Now the media throws it around all the time. Um, but because you conducted a study, you have found that your hypothesis was supported. It doesn't mean that you have proved. It's just likely that that would happen in, in that case. So um, when, you, when you think about research, keep in mind it means many different things. So here we get to IRB, Institutional Review Board. That's what it stands for. You need that when you're working with human subjects. So if you're doing a focus group, if you're handing out a survey, if you're doing an online survey, you have to have that approved. And um, this harkens back to um, the accords that happened after World War II. Because we know, um, sadly, that the Nazis experimented on people, uh, of course treating them more like animals than people. And so from that time forward, any research that is being conducted that wants to be published or presented, the person conducting it, has to make sure that they abide uh, by a series of agreements that went into the Helsinki Accords and some other things that happened. And you, of course, read that when you um, are approved by the Institutional Research Board. Now, when you're uh, conducting survey research, you say, well, you know, hey, I'm doing, uh, my research is about cell phone use. 
how can that be hazardous to anybody's health? Well, it probably wouldn't be, but there are some uh, surveys that require people to identify themselves, and in some cases, that might cause injury in a way, you know, so far as their identity is concerned or other information that they perhaps don't want to share. So if that's the case, even though it's likely to be exempt, you're also going to run that by your mentor, uh, your honors program advisor, and find out um, if it can be approved. I have a question. Yes. When conducting a survey, does it add more credibility if you have the names of people who took it, or is it just as credible if it was anonymous? It depends on the research that you're doing. Um, but typically, what the researcher does, especially if you're using qualitative research, and let's say that you're collecting 10 interviews. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my students um, did a, uh, well, she was focusing on how um, parents that are non-native of the United States raised their children to be culturally like the culture that they came from. Mm -hmm. She could not identify them by name because that was a confidentiality agreement. And so they were identified as mother 45 years old. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't make it more credible, but it, in, in your research, you're able to, to at least give the, con the context that the, that happened in. Uh, generally, in um, large surveys, and of course, to be statistically significant, you have to have at least 30 responses in qualitative research. And so usually in those, you're going to have them sign a consent form that they agree to participate, and they understand that there is limited harm in doing so. Um, but usually there's no identification attached to that, unless, for example, um, some of my research involved tracing GPA with um, students success, and they had to give me permission to link their GPA. In my paper, it, that was, I never identified John as being a 3-5 student, but I had that data because he allowed me to look up his GPA. Okay. Um, any other questions about that? All right. Um, so, um, to see the big picture, I wanted to, you to know of these programs. Uh, we just recently received um, an email from Dr. Shaver, who's provost at WT, and he reminded us of all these opportunities that we should let our undergrads know about. The McNair program has been in existence, of course, since the Columbia shuttle tragedy. But at WT, it means that 12 to 14 students are chosen each year for the McNair program. Uh, they receive a stipend for doing um, research during the summer. They are assigned a faculty mentor. I'm working with a student right now, uh, Miles Smith, and he is, his paper is on the selfie generation, <laughs> which was pretty fun. Um, and then what McNair does at WT, if you are accepted as a McNair scholar, they, uh, the McNair program, meaning they, will pay for um, all of the college admission charges. Let's say you want to apply to five different schools. Well, they will pay for that. They will take you to research conferences at no cost. You have to write the paper, you have to get the presentation, but um, they will take care of your lodging, and they will fly you where you need to go, and they will even cover costs of, of college visits. So if you wanted to go and see Harvard, um, they, would, they would help finance that trip. Uh, so it's highly competitive, but a great program to be in, and really uh, lets you uh, experience the, the whole world of research. Um, STEM fields, especially through the Smithsonian Internship Program, you can just go online and look that up. Uh, but many of you are, are know are interested in sciences, and so this is something to pursue. But you can also look at um, local um, opportunities. My daughter Tori loved biology. She was a, a biology major in college, but her her the years that she graduated from Randall, she applied for the internship at Texas Tech University. Um, and some of you have probably been in that. It was a wonderful experience. She got to have hands-on bench science experience that, in fact, when she was a senior at her university, she already had done some of the stuff that those students were doing for the very first time. Um, and it was because of the internship that she got through that summer program. So the National Science Foundation has those kind of things as well. And then if you look on the internet for ORIs, um, that's through the Department of Energy, but there's some, there are again some undergraduate possibilities um, for you. Now, um, so far as academic conferences are concerned, um, how many of you have been to an academic conference? Okay, so tell us about it. 
<laughs> a lot of posters all over the wall, and a lot of people talking, and mm. just standing around posters. And yeah. Like that. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's food. a good and food. Okay. <laughs> well, that, that's a good description. Um, many of you, if you've not presented at a conference before, you're not sure what that means. And and I remember uh, when Leslie went to Southern the first time, uh, she asked that question too. Well, what what do we do? <laughs> and because it, it's a it, it's a new experience. Um, there are usually two formats, and usually it either can be a panel presentation where you are presenting your research with uh, four or five other people, and you have about 10 minutes to give your um, presentation. And you have a respondent who talks about your work and sometimes offers suggestions. At uh, Southern States, at the undergraduate research conference there, the uh, respondent generally is very supportive and is very complimentary of the work. You don't feel challenged. You know, you don't feel like somebody is trying to say, why did you research that? They, they usually are um, very supportive of you. Or you can do research posters. Now, uh, I brought a couple of research posters to show you. And I also, um, if you go online to the American Evaluation Association, I just want to pass those around, you can get uh, this handout online and you'll see it more clearly. But I went ahead and brought a paper copy because if you look at the, app, the advice that they give you, um, this was the poster before they talked, uh, they took into consideration design elements like color and, and pictures. And, it, and you can see that if you were looking at one of these, this would be your least favorite, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't want your poster to look like that. But your poster has to be informative, um, but in a way that somebody can grasp really quickly. Because if you're at a conference where posters are being judged, a judge may have as many as 10 posters to review. And they can't stand and look at yours for 30 minutes. You know, probably you're going to have five minutes of their time. But at conferences like the National Communication Association, they have scholar-to-scholar -scholar sessions. And you just stand by your poster in this big hotel room. And people come by. And you just visit about the research, and the poster ends up being a backdrop to that. The conference that you'll be um, participating at WT, um, you can do, again, after you've written your paper, you can do the research poster, put it together. We'll talk about the elements in just a minute. You'll be uh, visited by faculty members and other students at the conference, and you'll get to talk about whatever your research is, but it will be for very short periods and not before a whole audience. The panel presentation is when you have uh, an audience and a respondent. So those are um, those are the options generally that you see. Um, now, as you think about your poster, here are the general things that it needs to include. In your cases, maybe right now you're just doing the research proposal, and if you're just doing the research proposal, it's going to end right here because you won't have results yet. But you can still have these headings, and so um, you. Um, in, in the particular poster that you see here, this is Stephanie Williams, one of our graduate students, and I have a, an enlargement of her poster that, to show you in a few minutes. But what you have, of course, is your name and affiliation, the rationale, the answer why, um, your, theoretic, your theoretical perspective, what are you using to help you make sense of this, um, a short literature review, and obviously that's not going to reflect your whole paper because your paper is going to cite many sources, but on your poster you're just going to get the highlights. Um, you'll have the research question, and again, in social science research, don't use yes or no questions. You want to use how, or what happens when, or if I compare. Um, and then the method will be chosen by you. You could do a rhetorical criticism, which looks at images and words, and you could do a quantitative study. Um, but again, remember uh, that you have to get, um, if you're just doing a proposal, you don't have to get I review approval at this point. You're going to present the results and you'll have a conclusion. Um, in looking at research proposals or uh, research posters, this was one that was prepared by a graduate student. Uh, what do you like about it? Simple. Picture. There's a clean. Yeah. It's not overwhelming. It's not overwhelming, or right. You, uh, you don't have too much data to process at one time. Um, now, if you look carefully, she has included uh, most of the things that I've talked about, she's, she's talked about methods, she has a research question, it's organized a little differently perhaps than uh, what my, my list has. But this student is working on her master's in communication, but her really, her big love is 
animals, or particularly bats. <laughs> and she thinks they've gotten a bad rap. <laughs> and so, um, anyway, that was, that was her research poster. Um, now this one you cannot see very well. Uh, the font is too small, and, and this, this picture that I dropped into the PowerPoint uh, doesn't give you all the things that you need. But Johnny Oliver is a soccer player at WT. He's from the UK, <coughs> so we all like to hear him talk. Um, anyhow, Johnny um, was interested particularly in, in social media, and so he designed his poster as if it were a Facebook page. And so it's not a Facebook page. It includes all the things that the method, the rationale, the intro, and his method, you know, how he is going to process this, um, his thesis that he's hoping to do. But he, I thought he used a, a clever way of, of showing that. Okay, let me show you uh, Stephanie's poster. It is too large to, let's see if I can get to it. Now, um, Stephanie did have to get IRB approval for this because um, she wanted to look at, and she calls it Princess Parenting, the insight and perception of the Disney parent. Mm. And so she uh, wanted to talk to parents and also um, observe their children watching Disney films. And, and so uh, she sent her proposal to IRB and got it approved. And so when she designed her research poster, I think it's uh, quite clever the way she did it. The intro is actually the center slide. And so you go in either direction. Um, she explains the literature, how she plans to apply it, and then the method is here. So when you were face to face with it, and the poster is quite large, you would be able to see it in more detail. Uh, but it's colorful. Uh, it makes you kind of wonder, you know, um, how the research would go. And um, so let me have a couple volunteers to hold this up. I did not bring the the version that is backed by one that holds on the side. Okay. Now, aren't they great models? Okay. <laughs> now, this is usually the standard research poster size. And at WT, they will have easels with uh, a little sticky thing that you can have either Velcro or something else to attach a poster. If it is mounted, and you can mount a poster, I just didn't bring my mounted posters. I wasn't sure how far away I had to park. <laughs> uh, what's the, what are the dimensions? Um, this one is, I think, 42 by, I'll, I'll send it to you. They're, this, the other one, I think, is a little different size. Um, but these, this is the standard size. The, the poster that you see up there that Stephanie did, it, in reality, was that size. Um, and so, in this case, my study was a rhetorical study. What I did last summer is analyze the, um, the speeches that President Obama has given at commencement exercises since becoming president. Um, I was interested in this particular genre of speaking because that's often discounted. Nobody remembers what the commencement speaker said. Um, however, we continue to go to commencements and we continue to have speakers. And I wondered what his commencement speaking had to say um, about how he viewed um, what citizenship should mean. So the abstract is, again, the little overview of what I found. Um, the method, in this, in this case, I chose a close textual analysis. Um, and that is a, a method that's used in rhetorical criticism. And what I, what I analyzed in the method section, I listed all of the speeches that I had transcripts of. So I read the speeches. I watched them on video. And I found, when looking at the, uh, the speeches themselves, three things that kept reappearing. And so in my poster, uh, I listed those. Persever perseverance, civility, community, and government by the people. And I included a short quote in some cases of those. So far as this is concerned, because it was presented at the library research poster uh, presentation that we have down at WT, and you're all welcome to attend that. That's going to be on February 25th. And I'll send, uh, I'll send Mrs. Carter more information about that. Uh, it's come and go, but it's held in the Cornette Library. Um, because that was presented there, I had to indicate where this was presented. It was presented at a conference. And if it was published, I also would put um, the journal that it was published in. Um, it is not as colorful as Stephanie's by far, but it's broken up with having a photo here, and then, of course, the presidential seal there. So you can think of some design things 
that would cause people to want to come to your poster and look at it. Okay, let's look at a second example. That's a really creative idea about the poster. Thank you. Um, this next poster is for a different kind of study. Um, and so we used a different, different way of looking at it. And again, thank you, Mom. <laughs> uh, again, these posters are easy to transport, so if you are going farther than Canyon, you can just um, roll them up and take them on the, on, on, on the airplane. Okay, so um, this time we put our affiliation, uh, we didn't put our affiliation, we just put our names down here. My faculty uh, colleagues, Chris Drumheller and Jessica Mallard, were um, part of this study as well. So the abstract is here, and what we talked about in this particular study is how we can get students to read the assigned reading. Now, <laughs> you guys are atypical, <laughs> but what we have found is that even though we have a textbook and we have chapters that you're supposed to read, guess what? We don't. <laughs> yeah. They don't. They don't. <laughs> they don't. <laughs> Actually, probably, and, and probably faculty members are in the same boat, because when we did our lit review, uh, Rebecca Nathan, that is her, um, her false name. She's actually a sociology professor that went, took a sabbatical leave and then attended Arizona State University as a freshman. She was pretending to be a freshman. That's and so cool. And guess what she found? She didn't read anything unless it was <laughs> going to be on the desk. And so she identified that as a problem. She said, and of course it's because of the um, increased demands on our time. Uh, you as students have your schoolwork, you have family responsibilities, you have work responsibilities, and all of that boils down to, I will only read something if I have to read it. And so, for us, that means as a professor, I've got to give you a reason to read. So, what we did with the research, we, we wanted to use this whole idea of sticky notes to, to look like, <laughs> well, sort of to look like my, what my office looks like. So, um, the research question was, what effect does the completion of reading logs have on students learning and organization and uh, engagement in communication courses. So we did this study using um, three different, four different communication classes. And what students had to do for each of the reading assignments, they had to cite a personal experience that went with whatever the reading was. Um, they had to report that and they had to use logic in doing so. And we gave them sort of, you know, um, step-by-step -step process. They didn't have to write very long things, and they just uploaded it to WT class, our course management system. And um, what we found that um, the students who participated in those had better grades in the courses. They read the material, and of course that's what we were hoping for. So um, we also, because this was a, a study that wanted opinions from students to support our ideas, uh, we included that too. Um, and, and student comments helped us understand at least why they were working or why they weren't working, and why this would be a, a something that professors could have that. Yeah. Did you have to get IRB? Uh, we did, because even though the students were not at harm in any way, we were using the classroom to gather that. Now, thank you guys. Uh, so in uh, in conducting that research. Um, the reason we had to have IRB approval um, was because that the students were not required to do the reading logs. They were encouraged to do that, but we couldn't make that be part of their grade. And so they could opt out. And you always in research have to give the choice to opt out, or we're back to um, treating people with disrespect like what happened um, in World War II. Now, um, specifically, I know that, that uh, our time is probably gone. What this information is, this is just the schedule for the research conference at WT that's happening on April 16th. I talked to um, April Swindell, who is um, the staff member charged with updating the webpage. The, the webpage at WT has not been updated yet. Um, but this is a schedule that's going to be followed. And um, let me see if I can take you to. Let me show you the site, even though it's not, um, 
not updated, so you can see information that you're going to be able to find here. All you do when you go to the WT main, um, main page, hit search, and then down here, just put WT Research Conference, Student Research Conference. And that will take you to the home page that is not updated right now. Um, but what I would like you to, to uh, look at is the this menu over here, because there are poster guidelines, which will tell you about um, the size poster that you have, the basic poster format, and there's a link to examples of posters, kind of like the ones that we um, looked at today. But there's another one, for those of you who are in um, creative majors, like art or dance or um, music, you also can enter it. Now, it may not fit the parameters of the assignment that your honors program uh, faculty have given you. But our students in communication, uh, Dr. Rodovedian's class, she has an advanced performance class, and they did ethnographic performances. And they uh, submitted them to the conference. And so there are creative panels as well. So if you have art, art if uh, we didn't last year, uh, but we have had students who uh, are in the fields of music and theater, and they performed a piece. And so that, that's an option as well. Um, and then if you go to the paper guidelines, again, looking at the, the side menu, um, it, it specifies, and of course you already know this, the, the paper has to reflect the student's work rather than the work of the faculty member. So for example, if you are currently engaged with a faculty member and doing research, that's great, but the paper you submit for the conference should be primarily your work that the faculty member has, has mentored you in doing rather than you uh, being listed as the, the second author. Um, so it gives you the, the paper presentation guidelines, uh, again, and um, there's judging rubrics. So anytime, and, and you know this uh, as well, but anytime that you enter something, you always want to know, well, so what are they looking for? Mm -hmm. And you pull this up, and you'll see the, um, the rubric that they're using. And you can do that for each one of the the categories. Now, for those of you who have been in Professor Gibson's classes and have some digital work, there is a category for that. So if you want to enter a documentary that you've done, a PSA that you have done, there's a digital category. You just have to email the, the conference, um, the staff member in charge of that so that we can be sure that we get your file uploaded. Are those separate entities, like the PSA and whatnot, and then the research for like? Right. Mm -hmm. What's it called? Presentations? Yeah, the, the paper presentations are the poster session. But if you go back, and let me go back there. Um, you have the digital humanities that you can enter, the creative arts that we talked about, poster or paper. So there's all of those different categories. So again, you have to get approval from the honors program if this is for the requirements that you need to do for honors that requires a paper, but if you have uh, another uh, entry that you would like to have in the digital category or the creative category, you can do that. The tricky thing, of course, is the schedule. So you need to do your research poster presentation. Those are going to happen in the morning, and then the, the paper presentations, as you can see on that schedule, happen um, at other times during that day. There are cash awards. The awards last year, I think the top award was $200 for the best paper, and a communication student took that home. <laughs> uh, in fact, Jennifer Harker is a, is a master's student, and uh, she has just been invited to um, to go and meet the people at the University of North Carolina um, in Chapel Hill for their PhD program. So we're hopeful that uh, that she'll be admitted. But. Anyway, all that information is that this is not updated, and so April is going to update that with the right dates, but these rubrics are not going to change. Those will stay the same. So you can go ahead and plan, even though we don't have the, you know, the exact amount of the cash awards. There will be a place on here that you actually submit, and your paper will be uploaded. And again, that's not here right now, but April said that would be coming soon. So questions? How many students generally present at this conference? 
Um, generally, there have been oh, probably between 65 and 75. Wow. How many people try to like uh, submit? Oh, the, you mean the acceptance rate? I think the acceptance rate is pretty high. I have not served on that committee. Um, I think for the most part, if people have followed the rules and met the deadline, they usually get to participate. Cool. Yeah. Cool. I like that. So, do they divide the students uh, by area of study um, based on their major? There is. Uh, in the and let me go back to the main page. The um, they combine some kind of interesting things. Um, if you, let's see, let me go to, I don't know if the categories are on the paper presentations list. No, it's not. I don't remember saying it. Um, what they have right now, um, it's usually divided into um, biology and, um, I, don't, I don't know if they use, they use biology and there are two other descriptors, but it has to do with what we would call the hard sciences. Um, I think that there's, all, there's the humanities category, um, there's also the social science category. So if you're an education major, you would probably go in social science. If you're a political science person, you'd probably go in that category. Um, there is the humanities, which includes not only English, but they also put communication in that category. But what they do, when they get papers, they link them by similar um, subject matter. Okay. So. Um, when our communication uh, students presented, they had different topics, but it all had to do with communication in some way. And when the um, folks from the, the English department presented, it had to do with literature and, you know, so there was a theme running through that panel. Yes? What program do you guys use usually to create the posters? Um, the ones that you see there were done in InDesign, but you can do it using a PowerPoint as well. What's the time it usually takes for the uh, IRB to like respond if you send in uh, you know, a request? To, to um, if it's going to be expedited, let's say you're doing survey research, uh, usually at WT that takes about two weeks. If it's human subjects research, it can take a little bit longer. And it's not, it's not because they're, they're not going to approve it, it's just that they look at it with a little bit um, harder eye because you have to have a consent form. When uh, my student collected information by phone interviews, even though that wasn't in any way going to harm someone, she had to fill the consent form that allowed the phone conversation to be recorded, and the person had to give consent. And Elliot, we can assist with that. We have people here on campus who serve. Is it like a website? application? Or do you have to no, no. We would walk over and talk to the Institutional Research Department and they would just submit it. And uh, at WT, again, what they've done for students is give them um, kind of a step-by-step -step guide. You're not competing with the vast number of AC students doing research? <laughs> at WT, there are a lot more people doing research, so they have to they have to have a more strict procedure, but so because okay. So if you just type in IRB on the WT home site, um, it's going to take you to this um, website that the IRB has developed for us, and they have they begin the questions that you're asking are very good questions because the very first question is, well, do I have to have IRB approval? And so they develop this chart and. I don't think a communication person designed this, but anyway. <laughs> I, I've looked at it several times, but you have a yes or no decision every time you see one of these. So are human subjects involved? And you answer that. Yes. Okay, that means you have to have. Uh, does the project meet the definition of research? I mean, are you collecting information that helps us understand something, or are you just spreading gossip? You know, I mean, definitely. <laughs> um, Okay, in, in this case, are vulnerable populations or sensitive subjects involved? And when you click on that, um, it includes these categories. So are you going to be interviewing children under the age of 18, mentally disabled persons, institutionally elderly? So there's some defined um, categories that are considered sensitive populations. Um, and even and IRB, anytime we do um, with students, they consider that. 
too. Now, um, when it says getting started, um, it gives you again um, the process that you go through. And although AC, the Belmont report is the one that I was talking about that you read, and then there is uh, some other training that you receive. But for students, it's expedited. For faculty members, they have to do a little bit more. Um, but like Professor Gibson has said, at AC, you probably are um, a few of the people that would be using that. So I'm sure it would be pretty quick. Um, a simple thing that sometimes the IRB lets you know about, let's say that I'm doing a focus group. Um, and I asked a question, um, and, and you know, it, again, it, this is a, an example of a question not to ask, but I'm having this focus group, and I want to know, um, do you use tobacco? Are you asking? I, no, that's a question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a yes-no question, right? Yeah. yeah. And so, on a survey where people were anonymous, I could probably ask that, but if it's a focus group, what's wrong with that? Like you're letting everybody know that you use tobacco, and that maybe not be something that you expose to everybody. Maybe it is, you know. But because I've asked that question, the IRB probably would have me rephrase it, especially if I were doing research about the health uh, impact of tobacco use on uh, students in college. Um, I would need to rephrase that and say, uh, what do you think about the use of tobacco? Do you see the difference? Mm -hmm. And then, yes, I'm collecting your opinions about the use of tobacco. I haven't asked if you've used it, have I? Mm -hmm. And so when they look at your, you have a research protocol that you have for your focus group, and so they'll look at the questions and they say, yeah, that one's okay, or hey, let's change that one up a little bit, and they just have you change it. So um, you can spend some time, especially if, if you're interested in learning more about that process, when you come to WT, we really, um, Love to have students interested in undergraduate research. There are research awards that are given each year. One of our uh, Ad PR students just received one, and one of our Com Studies students received one uh, a couple years ago. You compete with people across the university, and so again, it's highly selective. But we do have a track record of, of our students being <coughs> approved for their research. And then the research, like Chan just did on Big Bang Theory, doesn't require, require IRB because. That is taking a theory, applying it to a text, and reaching some conclusions. Is there a place you typically get the posters printed? Uh, well, our, the, at WT, we have a, um, in the ITS, the Instructional Training uh, Center, they, pub, they print it for us. Um, some students have gone to Kinko's. It can be kind of expensive. I was thinking maybe ABC Blueprint. Yeah, you, you could do that. That, but um, I know WT, I don't know what you have here to see if you have that capability. I don't think we can do that <laughs> large. But I know that some students for another project uh, that they were doing for a comm class, not for the research conference, uh, had it presented, had it printed at Kinko's. So you might need to look at costs. The, um, the thing about these are not laminated, and um, so lamination costs more. But usually when you're talking about uh, WT, uh, they charge us between $35 and $40. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, you wrap it up. <laughs> and if it's, uh, if, they, if they back it with a hard back, end, then that's a little different price, too. Uh, and the size differs for that. They don't have, typically, posters this size that have the, the hard back end on it um, because it becomes a little cost prohibitive. I can get you um, information about sizes that we use at, at, uh, at WT, though. Um, yeah, that, we'll email that to you. I'll have her send it to me, and I'll email it on to you guys. So, other questions? Well, if you decide to, if WT is, is your choice to move forward, um, when you come to transfer orientation, uh, I usually get to help with that. and. Whatever your field is, I would love to be able to visit with you and, and help you uh, maneuver through the, the transfer course. Uh, well, it's, it's not necessarily a jungle anymore. They've made it a little easier. Uh, <laughs> but often I can, uh, can help with some of the questions that you have about um, the equivalency, and, you know, courses that you want to be sure that are being counted, that don't look like they're being counted by admissions. 
And if that's the case, then often a person in your field or someone who teaches the general core can help and say, yeah, that's an equivalent class. So for example, the, um, there's a class that is taught in your um, mass media uh, curriculum that is um, 2311. And we count that as 2315 in our curriculum. And I know that, and it would be approved. But if someone in admissions has not filed that correctly, uh, then I can help figure that out. If we are going to present at WT, um, well, just for any of the presentations, how long are they typically approximately? Is there a time limit? Yeah, there is. Uh, for the, the paper, uh, the oral presentation one, if you choose to do that, you're probably going to have uh, 12 minutes. Uh, for the posters, as I said, the judges will come through and they may be assigned to see 10 posters. So they'll have a conversation with you, but likely it's not going to be more than five minutes. And of course, other people will be walking around. Uh, the poster session is in the alumni banquet hall, and so it'll be a big open space with lots of easels um, for you to put your posters on. It used to be called the South Dining Hall, but it's the alumni banquet hall. It has better curtains. And, and don't panic there. about the cost of printing because we can assist with that. Good questions. Anything else? So what, what you were saying earlier about the high acceptance rate, if we follow the format that we've been instructed to, if we, if we organize, that yes, <laughs> if we or organize our information in a very um, comprehensive and a very professional sort of way, there's a, it's, a, it's a good likelihood that we can. There's a strong likelihood, yes. Okay. I, I am not on the conference uh, committee for this year, um, but, <laughs> <laughs> but those, uh, those proposals come through, and if you have followed the submission guidelines, which indicate you have to indicate who your faculty mentor is, and you've got three of them here in the room, so you can list any of them. Um, that goes on the submission thing, and then you have to abide by the page requirements. So for example, you just have this great part in your paper, and it just puts it a little bit over 12, you know, 13 and a third, guess what, they'll kick it out. Mm -hmm. And um, that's just their rules, that's not mine. Also, uh, you have to get past us. <laughs> we, we get to choose which ones get submitted to WT before they get to choose whether they accept. <laughs> I'm glad I've been consulting you the whole time on my paper. Um, no, it's not. Okay. <laughs> oh. uh, I could. I did. <laughs> but um, but remember the very first advice I gave you. I know that we've talked about a lot of stuff already. Um, when you have the opportunity, choose the topic that you're interested in. Um, if, if you're not interested in it, then uh, research is not a, a very happy experience. But if you're <laughs> interested in it, even though sometimes you're tired of following the rules for APA format and can't get your header to line up in the right way, um, you still feel this great sense of accomplishment, um, you know, that you've done this. Um, and, and that's the way it should be. It should be um, something that you are proud of and you can say, yeah, I did this. I know that's how Tori felt after the end of her summer internship and she presented her research study with uh, the Tex Tech kids. Um, it, it was a poster I couldn't understand, of course. She's a scientist, <laughs> I'm not. Um, but I was very impressed and she had good images. So. <laughs> uh, anything else? Well, it looks like you have some extra cookies, so you guys should begin. Well, thank you very thank much. You so much. Thank you.